uh, I'm talking about radioactive nuclei. And why radioactive nuclei are so exciting and interesting? Because with radioactive nuclei, we can measure time. If you have a radioactive nucleus, you effectively have a watch, you have a clock. And the reason is quite simple. It all depends on the radioactive law of decay. This is one of the simplest law in physics. It basically only says that if you have a certain number of radioactive nuclei, you want to know what is the rate at which they disappear, they turn into something else in time. This rate is simply proportional to the number itself of the radioactive nuclei. It's very, very easy. And the, uh, the proportionality is given by this lambda, which is a constant. It doesn't change with time. And there is a minus there because the radioactive nuclei, they decrease. Because lambda is not a function of time, this equation is also very simple to, to, to solve, to integrate. You do a couple of easy steps and you get to the second equation, which is also very simple and just says that if you have the abundance of a radioactive nucleus at time t0 and at time t1, I will call them n0 and n1, I just take the difference in logarithm and this is the time difference. So this is why if I have a radioactive nucleus, I have a clock. Okay, I have to multiply here by a tau, which is the inverse of the decay rate, but this number we can find in the lab, we can measure in the lab. So wonderful, I have a clock, I want to understand something more about the formation of the solar system. So what I decide, I take one of my time, T0, as the birth of the sun. Actually, you might wonder because the birth of the sun didn't happen in one moment, but it was more like a long process. But here, my time zero is the time of the formation of the first solids when the sun formed. And if I take these, I have already half of my problem solved because I have N zero. We have the abundances of radioactive nuclei at the time of the formation of the sun from the analysis of meteoritic rocks and the, the, the little inclusion that we find in them. In the lab, we can measure these. So I already have a long list of numbers, and this is uh, part of them. Actually, these radioactive nuclei, there's, these are about half of them. I just selected the ones that are mostly well known. And I want to show you this list because it shows you what is the large variety of nuclei that we can play with. So we have nuclei that are very light, like the aluminum is very light, it only has mass 26. But I go up to nuclei that are 100 times heavier, like the corium 247. So this is a huge variety. And not only that, but their mean lives also vary a lot. The aluminum decays in one million years, but the samarium 146 in 100 million years. So I can use them to measure different type of time interval. They are clocked, they can measure different length. Uh, then we have here in the third column the reference isotope, because when, when there is the analysis of meteorite, we cannot get the absolute number of a nucleus. We always measure it relative to another one. And so this is the reference table or long leaf isotope that people use to measure these radioactive nuclei. And then we have in the last column the ratio as they are measured from the laboratory in the early solar system. And I want to highlight that some of these nuclei, we know them at the level of 5%. So this, the, the, I put the three question marks there because we have some systematic problems in these measurements, so some of these are very much still under debate. Uh, but in general, we have some amazing data and I want to use it. So half of my problem is solved, not by me, by people who work in the lab on meteorites to make this very high, amazingly high, high precision measurement. Okay, so what can we do? We have the sun, we can go, for example, forward in time. So if this is the line that shows time, we can go forward. And this has been done extensively, it is not what I will talk about. 
So basically, people have worked with radioactive nuclei to build up a detailed chronology of the formation of planets in the solar system. I don't have time to talk more about this. I want to bring you one example, the formation of the moon. We know that the moon formed 200 million years after the sun because of the analysis of these radioactive nuclei. And this is one example, but you can look at this paper if you want to learn more. What I am interested in is the other side of the story. Can I say something about what happened before the birth of the sun? And here you can already see that there is some more trouble because I don't have any rocks from before the birth of the sun. So how do I, I cannot measure in the lab N0 and N1. I have N0, but what is N1? I cannot measure it. This is coming from some theoretical idea, scenario, prediction that I can try to make. So I want to try to develop a, de a detailed chronology of the events that predated the birth of the sun. This is what I want to do. And to do this, I have to choose what is T1. First of all, what kind of time intervals can I measure? Do I want to measure? And then once I choose that, how do I find the abundance of a radioactive nucleus at that time T1? You can see it's not a very simple, uh, a simple problem. Okay, so now let's focus. Now I will zoom in and show you a qualitative uh, description of the events that predated the birth of the sun. So now we focus on the left side of this plot and I go into a bit more details. So what is this, qualitatively speaking, prehistory of the matter that we have now in the solar system? We think we can divide it in two major phases. The first phase is very long is the Milky Way age until the sun was born. So say about 10 billion years. And this involved a lot of stars that were born and died before the formation of the sun. Thousands of stars, hundreds of thousands of stars. All these stars, depending on their mass and where they were born, and if they were in a binary system, they, throw, they, they, they live, they die. And when they die, they throw out the elements of which, of which we are made, of which our world is made, everything from the carbon, oxygen, uranium, lead, and everything. This is one phase. But then, to actually form a star, you have to be in a stellar nursery in a colder region of the interstellar medium. So this is what we call a stellar nursery, a star formation cloud, and it has to be not the turbulent, hot interstellar medium. It's a special place. And then, we don't know how long it passed and we formed the sun. So this is an interesting time because to know more about the stellar nursery can tell me more about the circumstances of the birth of the sun and if they were special or normal, if the sun is a normal star or not. Interestingly, we don't know almost anything about this a priori. So that's why the radioactive nuclei become so important as a tool. And now I just apply my tool. This is easy. I just do this. If I have the exponential decay, I can move from T0 to T1, and I choose T1 to be something that tells me when this stellar nursery was born, so I long how much time it elapsed. And then I have N0, N1, and the problem is solved. And zero, I already said, I have it from the meteoritic data. Now I am interested in N1. How can I define, how can I find the number to put in there? And then I can solve the problem. So this number, as I said, is not uh, an experimental number. We have to build the theory. So we have stars that produce radioactive nuclei, then they throw them in the Milky Way galaxy, and somehow they evolve. We have to model these. So now, again, I'm going to zoom in to the left side of this uh, slide and go into more details about what happens in the Milky Way in the, in, the, in the terms of the chemistry of the Milky Way. And this is what some people call the cycle of matter in a galaxy. It's pretty much what I already explained, but with a few more details. So basically, you have stars that are born in the stellar nursery. The stars evolve, and depend on their mass, they can take billions of years if they are like the sun or low mass, or they can take just millions of years if they're more massive. 
Then we have stellar wind supernova explosion. If we have binary system, different type of supernova, neutron star merger, black hole, black hole mergers. We have a lot of events. And this event, they can all throw out chemical elements. These chemical elements are ejected in their surrounding. They feed back into the interstellar medium, and then you form new star, and you start the cycle again. We can model these with a code, with some, with some computer codes, and this is what we've done. We want to do it for radioactive nuclei. So we want to know the abundance N1. It would be the abundance of a radioactive nucleus in the interstellar medium at the time when the sun was born. And this is quite simple, because you can see, as time passes, the ratio of a radioactive nucleus to a stable nucleus decreases. This is easy to explain, because the radioactive nuclear reaches a steady state, because the more you produce, the more it decays. If you remember, the decay law depends on how much I have. So it will reach a steady state between these two processes. But the stable nucleus does not decay, so you just accumulate it. So necessarily, the ratio goes down with time. We model this, and you see we have an uncertainty area. This is the blue area, because the galaxy is not that simple. As you can imagine, we have uncertainty in the star formation rate, uncertainty is how much gas is in stars, uncertainty is about infall and outflows with the medium around the Milky Way itself. And we try to account for all these uncertainties, and that's why we get this band. And then we look at the time predicted by this model, when the, when the sun formed. This is when there is enough ion, as much as we have in the sun. And I solve my problem. I have n one is the number I can put in there. So this would be the end of the story, but it's more interesting. Because the problem with these models is that the interstellar medium is considered homogeneous. So it's instantaneously mixed. And this is not reality. If you have a stable nucleus, it doesn't matter too much. But when you have a radioactive nucleus, the radioactive nucleus decay in a certain time scale. And so this approximation does not work if you want to do it properly. So what happens? I will uh, try to explain it a bit more, uh, a bit more figuratively. So if I am here and I, and I am in a certain space of the interstellar medium, a certain, a certain little parcel of gas that will end up being the solar system. I have a star that produces a radioactive nucleus and throw it in. Then there's no star continuously producing radioactive nuclei. The stars are discrete events. I have to wait. I have to wait a certain interval. And while I wait, I decay. So the crucial, uh, the crucial ratio is the mean life and the time interval between different injections. And here we have two regimes. If the mean life is much shorter, I add the radioactive nucleus, and then before the next addition, I'm gone. I'm, I, am, I have decayed. And so I have the top panel of the figure here, where my abundance is zigzagging and hovering between zero and a maximum value. But if my mean life is longer than the time between the additions, then I can keep the memory. I remember the previous events. I don't forget about them. I keep some of the nuclei that came from those events. And in this case, I, I don't stay close to zero, but I can build some higher numbers. And this is what it shows in the lower panel of the figure. The situation is complicated because if the addition was at the constant rate, say every 10 million years, I get the blue line, which is obviously quite systematic. It just goes up and down. But that's reality, again, is not that simple because the addition could happen once after 20 million years, once after five, I don't know a priori. So we have studied this statistically by doing random additions. And this is one example, the red line, where you see that the uncertainty due to this process is bigger than if we could only choose a constant interval. But we cannot do that. So what we did, we did a statistical study. We ran 10,000 of these cases, and then we could do statistics and get an error bar about this process. 
And the result is, uh, depends obviously by these two different regime. When I can build a, a memory, I can also build a distribution function. I have an average and I have an error bar. When I don't build a memory, I cannot do that. We had to invent something different. And we decided it would be interesting to know what is the probability that the, the radioactive nucleus that we see in the solar system only come from one event. Only what, it has the memory of only one event. And of course, the shorter the mean life, and the more likely that he forgot about everything that happened before. So this is the plot on the right. So if the tau divided gamma, the mean life divided interval, gets shorter and shorter, I basically see more and more just on one event. This is quite powerful. I will show you in a minute. OK, now I have a methodology. This is not the end, because this is just the temporal homogeneities. We have special homogeneities. We're working on this. So it is the, it's half of the story, but we're still working on this. But anyway, we are curious. We, we want to start applying it to something real. This is just theory. Something real are my nuclei here. They exist, the, the, the radioactive nuclei that we see in the early solar system. This is the same table that I showed before. I will focus on the top seven. One of the reasons I do this is because the top seven, if you, as you can see, they're all heavy. They're all heavier than ion. Ion is 56 in mass, so these are heavier. And I studied the origin of these elements for 30 years, so, so I thought this is a very good place that I can, I can, I can apply my, my knowledge, is looking at these nuclei. OK, so how do, which stars produce these nuclei? Now I have to go a bit into nuclear physics to show you uh, how they look like and how can we produce them. So this is a nuclear chart. It's basically the, the periodic table extended in an extra dimension because here we are interested in isotopes. So the periodic table, you add a proton and in this chart you're moving vertically. But we also have another dimension where you move horizontally and you add neutrons. Because nuclei is much more important uh, how many neutrons and protons they have. I want to know both. On this chart, I am plotting there everything in the universe uh, is in this chart. Every matter, baryonic matter in the universe is here. The black line are the stable nuclei. And, they go, and, the, and the pink and blue and other colors, they are radioactive nuclei that we can observe in the laboratory. There are others out of this chart because we cannot observe them. So you see, we start from hydrogen and helium at the bottom. So you have two black boxes next to each other. One is hydrogen one, one is deuterium, helium is helium three and four, and so on. You go to carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, all the other common elements, aluminum, magnesium, silicon, etc., and you end up to lead. Lead is still quite low in the nuclear chart. There's still four-fifths of the nuclear chart are elements heavier than iron. And how do, we, how do we produce them? They have more than 26 protons in their nucleus. They have a strong Coulomb barrier. They will not capture a charged particle. It just, cut, just cannot get close. But we have neutrons. We can put neutrons as close as we want because they don't have a charge. So the way to produce this element is via neutron captures. And I will show you uh, a little detail. So we have two types traditionally of neutron captures, rapid and slow. The rapid neutron capture had a lot of media attention in the past few years because we finally identify one of the possible sources in the galaxy, neutron star merger. So we saw the gravitational wave event uh, connected to a short gamma ray burst. So that was a neutron star merger event. And luckily, we also saw a hypernova there, which is extremely rare event, where, which we believe is powered by the radioactive decay produced by heavy nuclei made by the R process. So it was outstanding result that finally we can see an R process direct observation for the first time. The slow process is easier because we know since the 50s we observe the spectra of giant stars and we see elements made by the S process. So this is easier, we know where it happens. Then we have another process, the P process, because there's a few nuclei, about 30, 35, that cannot be made by either of those, so we, and they are proton-rich, so there is a P process. 
To explain a bit better, I will zoom in in that region here. So the red line is the S-process path. You capture neutrons. So in the nuclear chart, you're jumping from one block to the next to the next in the horizontal, going to the right. But then at some point, you produce an unstable isotope. In the S-process, the unstable isotope, it's slower, it's a slow process to capture a neutron and decay. So it will decay. And so we have this red line that zigzags up the black boxes. The R process is the opposite. It's a rapid process. So when you produce an unstable nucleus, it is more rapid for it to capture a neutron than decay. So you are producing extremely neutron-rich material. We are going out of the slide, out of the window of the building, because these are very, very neutron-rich. Their neutron density 10 to the 25 like in neutron star mergers, you can imagine. But then when the neutron finish, there's nothing you can do than decay to the stable isotope of the mass that you produced. So the R process here is represented by the blue arrow. There is the yellow box there that is not made by any neutron capture process. It cannot be reached. So this is one of these P strange isotopes that are difficult to explain. As you can see, I also circle the blue box there because this is one of my isotopes. That's iodine-129. It lived 15 million years. It's on my list. And now I hope I convince you that it's an R-process isotope. So that's the first one. R-process isotope. Plutonium and curium, there's no way we can make them with slow process because the slow process stops at lead at, bis at bismuth, the last black boxes in the chart. Beyond that, you keep on decay instead of capturing neutrons. So these other two guys, actinides like uranium and thorium, they can only be made by the R process. Then I have two isotopes, the samarium-146 and niobium-92. They are on the other side of the black stability boxes, and they are P isotopes. And finally, the last two, they can be produced by both, by the R and by the S process. I can reach them in both directions. Okay, now I want to put everything together. This list of isotopes with the methodology that I discussed before. The list of isotopes here. Now I'm removing the plutonium because I'm not 100% convinced about the early solar system number, so please, for the moment, uh, we are working on this and I leave it out. I have six isotopes from three different processes. How do they behave relatively to the galaxy? So what is their mean life relatively to the time interval between events? The R process I just mentioned, we believe it comes from rare events because compact mergers are rare. They don't happen very often. They're not around the corner. So we believe that the time interval there is a consensus, it should be between 100, 500 million years. This is a huge interval, but we cannot do much better. But because their mean life is about 20 million years, I'm sure I am in this regime. So I can determine the time of the last event, and this is what we did. So if I go back to this picture, I can identify one of those last stars that contributed to the matter in the solar system in that specific situation. It's about 100 to 200 million years from the form before the formation of the solar system. The, the, the big uncertainty is due to this gamma. Uh, at the moment, I cannot do much about it. But uh, we have a bonus here. We have a R process event that everybody's chasing to understand better these events. Now we have one. We can see it in these isotopes. And we were very lucky. We first noticed something quite trivial. You can see that iodine-129 and curium-247, they have pretty much the same half-life. This is quite a crazy situation, because then the system of them, if I take the ratio of them, the equivalent half-life is the multiplication of the two divided the difference. So I get five giga a year for this system. It's very long lived. This means that their ratio didn't change from the last event to the early solar system. The early solar system is telling us what that R process event produced. So this is just uh, 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 what I just said. Uh, if I take the ratio of uh, radioactive to a stable isotope, I get the zigzagging that I already discussed before. 
But if I take one to the other, it's flat. It's not changing since the time of the last event. So this was very exciting. So I go into all the literature and I get what is the number? What is this ratio? I, I get all the numbers from people who do this analysis in the lab. I get 438. <laughs> and this we call it the magic number. Do exist an R process event that can produce this number? I have no idea because I am not an expert in R process modeling. So we have to talk to, our, to the people we work with in the US and in Germany and tell us, can you find a model that produces this ratio? And they did. So this was good. We are not completely out of nature. They, uh, the problem with the R process is that we don't know the site. So neutron star merger, they have ejecta. So these are dynamical sites. They have a disk. That's another type of situation. Then there's black hole neutron star merger. Sometime, some type of rare supernova can also produce it. So on the bottom there, it's different astrophysical site. And then the nuclear physics is unknown because we're going out of anything we can measure in the lab. We, can, we have to use nuclear physics modeling. So that's the top. Uh, but as you can see, we found some solution in the disk ejecta of neutron star mergers. So now we can even say, something more, a direct obs observational constraint. This would be the second one for the R process so far, after the, the hypernova. OK, but I continue with this. These are just little exciting digression, exciting for us. Uh, then we move to the S process. To the S process, well, first of all, if the last R process event happened 100 million years ago, and these S process isotopes, they decay much faster than the other. The mean life is half. They forget that event. What we have in the solar system is mostly what the S process made of them. Lucky. So then I can constrain them only using the S process. The problem is that I don't know what is gamma for low mass stars that make the S process. So at the moment, I, I am open to all possibilities. If gamma is greater than 20 million years, I am in this situation, and I can define when happened the last small, slow mass star that produces process event before the formation of the solar system. I don't have, to I don't have time to discuss manganese 53, but this is very interesting because it's mostly a product of type 1a supernova that are the merger or, inter or the accretion of white dwarfs, and they are important uh, uh, in general in astrophysics. I can time those two. On the other hand, the P process is the opposite. The P process, uh, we don't know how it happened, where it happened exactly, but it's supernova. Supernova are much less rare than neutron star mergers and copper mergers, and they travel really fast in the interstellar medium. We think that gamma is small. The mean lives are high, so I have the other situation when the mean life divided the gamma is greater than three, and I can this time not sample the last event, but find actually the N1 at that time with a certain uncertainty given by the statistical study, and this is what we did. But the P process is a bad child. No one really knows it. No one really understands it. Here I assume that both those isotopes come from type 1a supernova is one theory, and they don't work with each other. As you can see, we have problems here. But if I assume that the S process also behaved this way, then I can find self-consistent solution also with the ion 60s and other isotope that is interesting and I don't have time to talk about. So this is the point where we stand now. And now to the second part of the talk. It's like, why am I so interested in trying to understand the circumstances of the birth of the sun? Why am I chasing this time so strongly, trying to understand how much time is passed between the birth of the stellar nursery and the birth of the sun? Why? The main reason is that the shortest lived radioactive isotope, like the aluminum 26 I mentioned at the beginning, has a one million half life, most likely come from phase two. There's, it doesn't have a long life enough to survive much within a phase two. So everybody think it comes from something that happened close in time and space to the birth of the sun. And T-Zizopo is interesting for 
the, the issue of habitability. Why is that possible? What's the connection between radioactivity and habitability? The connection is that radioactivity is also heat. With radioactive decay, you can produce heat. I'll show you a quick example. The aluminum-26 is the most famous one. So aluminum-26 is a nucleus. I put it in a rock. It has 0.7 million year half-life. It decays into magnesium-26. Now we see it in the rock, so we see there was something strange, and it is aluminum-26. But the angular momentum of aluminum-26 uh, is 5, and magnesium-26 is 0. So it has to lose some energy. So it doesn't decay to the ground state of magnesium-26, but to an excited state. And when immediately it decays to the ground state, you release a 1.8 MeV photon. And if you have as much aluminum-26 as we know was in the solar system, this is a quite a bit of heat. Interestingly, these gamma ray photons, we observe them in the galaxy by satellite observation, spectrograph of these, uh, these high energy photons. So there is aluminum-26 in the galaxy produced by stars. We see it in the Milky Way. But put that photon into a rock. Put that photon into, a, into one of the first planetesimal that form in the early solar system. These are rocks of about 10, 30 kilometer radius. It will generate heat and it will melt it. So we have the melting of the core, and the core will then mix, so you end up with an ion core. This is where ion meteorites come from. So this happened in the solar system because there was aluminum-26. So it changed the thermomechanical evolution of the planetesimals. And if the planetesimal was beyond the snow line, so far away from the sun, that there was ice there, in principle, it would have been made by chemistry, half ice and half rock. But then put some radioactive decay in there. The ice melts, the water degas, the water goes around, maybe the chemistry changes and then it degas. So you lose a lot of water here. This is a very nice picture from Tim Lichtenberg paper last year that show quite nicely what happens here in the two situations. So if you are at the left side of the figure in the blue area, it is a hypothetical case with no aluminum-26 or very little. Then you have planetesimal accrete and that making planets like the Earth. But while they accrete, they stay water rich and you end up with an ocean planet. On the other side, the red bit is where there was there is enough aluminum-26, like in the solar system, or even more, who knows. In this case, as they accrete, the planetesimal dehydrate, and then you end up like a planet, with a planet like the Earth, which is water poor, or only about 1-2%. So this is very relevant because we want to know if other planets in the Milky Way, do they behave like the blue region or the red region? So what is the common situation? And so the question is, uh, are the other planetary system aluminum-26 rich or poor? We don't know. The problem is that we don't even know why we have aluminum-26 in the solar system. So this is the question. Why was there? There are two main, major um, classes of thoughts. There is the more traditional idea from the 70s that there was something local, one star, one supernova, one wind nearby to where the solar system forms. So you need to have a star dying next to the solar system being born. This is quite unusual. And then you inject the, the, the aluminum-26. But even this, uh, uh, you can inject it when the disk is already formed. You can inject it in the, in the cloud and trigger its collapse. We don't know. Or you can think that during phase two, if phase two is long enough, if the stellar nurseries was large, you have different generation of stars and they evolve and some of them will pollute uh, the star forming clouds so that all the stars born there will more or less feel something and have aluminum 26. This is a more common situation maybe. And I, now I'll finish with a slide. I made this slide to scary people because when one approaches this problem, 
there are a lot of literature. At the bottom is a selection of papers. I try to take the more representative. And people take a paper and they think, ah, this is the solution. Well, each of these papers has made at least three levels of, of, of assumption in the scenario they are investigated. So we have to be very careful when you're looking at that. Do we have multiple sources or one source, for example? When did the pollution happen? Or, of course, we need short-lived stars because we are in, a sh in phase two is short. But uh, massive stars that live short, they can have winds or they can explode. So all of these make different ramifications. So I want to just warn people to be careful when they pick up one of these papers because it's always a very specific case. And the problem in the literature today is that there's no consensus. We, no, no one agrees with each other. No one even cites each other often, as you know how it goes. And so this aluminum 26 was discovered in 1977. We still have no consensus of why it, it was there. It was actually predicted in the 50s because someone said we need a radioactive source in the solar system. It should have been aluminum 26, then it was discovered. But still, we don't know its origin. And this, as I said, has uh, important implication about the statistic of stars like the sun and if the star is special or not. And just to finish off, uh, I, I hope it is quite clear how uh, radioactive nuclei can be used to better understand the birth of our star, of the sun. Uh, the circumstances of that birth, uh, the type of stellar nursery, if it was born in a big family or in a small family and all this. But then we need to understand first the nuclear physics, the, the, the stellar production, and the Milky Way galaxy, the evolution of the Milky Way. So it's a lot of ingredients going there. For aluminum 26, we still don't have an answer on why it was there, but we know it has important implications for the planets. Um, and because my project is still running for about two and a half, three years, I am hoping maybe in three or four years uh, we can say something stronger about both the, 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 the circumstances of the birth of the sun, the aluminum 26, and in the end, if the sun, if we are, how special is the earth in the Milky Way. And I thank you for the, the attention. Thank you a lot.